I think that was some honest kind of dejection there because he did. I know you were saying it's been about level, but the last two games, if we had to summarize, Wesley's been the one pushing, right? So it, it starts to feel a little bit like you're, you know, we, we don't like those storylines in matches like this because if the victories are, are escaping you, you can lose matches by not converting. Yep. And, you know, that definitely – we heard Dingley run yesterday, right? Of course, the final result was clearly heavily in Jan Napomish's favor, but Dingley run had several advantages that he didn't convert on, and yep. that's why the match seemed to get out of hand in the early going. Question there from Prof Gamer. When is the Hikaru Duda match? It is December 4th. Thank you for asking that. Mark your calendars. That'll be a fun one as well, because obviously yep. Hikaru being the favorite, but young Christoph Duda playing super elite level chess these days in yep. classical. He is you know, nearly 2760. His uh, speed chess championship history has been one marked by great upset victories in his favor. And so, comebacks. They call him the comeback kid. I think I called him do. that and then say they so that it sounds more legitimate. But yeah, you also called him Rick Astley Jr. And I did try to Rick roll me in yep. the process. That's right. Um. All right, let's talk about this exchange here because this is educational, I think, for the viewers to break down. How can White justify a departure of a fiend kettle bishop denying the protection of the light squares? Give us, give us the grandmaster one-two punch here. Why is bishop take c6 a line? I don't really like the line, but okay. why it is a line is because um, what black gains out of White giving up this fiend kettle bishop is control of the light squares. Right. White, White has yet to castle kingside, which means that scores like h3, g2 are not as vul vulnerable just yet. Right. And the long-term potential, that's what White is counting on, against these double pawns. Now, it's not easy to pile up pressure on those pawns, which is why I don't particularly love it. But you can undouble Black's pawns if you gain important space in the process. You see this often in uh, openings like the Rosalimo. If you yeah. play, say... A3, B4 at the right moment, say, okay, I'll undouble your C pawns, but you lack space and your two bishops are not working in open space. Uh, they just you know, happen to be on the board. Again, yeah, it's a, it's I really a good like point because we've got kind of a close center. So while normally, yes, you look at this bishop, you look at these light squares and it spells problems, but but where's the beef, right? So you put the bishop on H3, but okay, Maxime's going to move the rook and then how, how are you really following up on these weak squares, right? Um but okay, I mean, I, but I'm with you because I, I'm going to show on the announcement why I agree that this line is kind of weird. Because even though we're justifying the departure of the bishop, normally it's done like if these pawns are isolated, right? Like remove the D pawn and look at how horrible those pawns are. They're weak, they're doubled, they're isolated, it, it's bad. But in a situation like this, and even in the live position, while the pawns are doubled now, they're not really that weak, right? So the fact that black has been given the bishop pair long term and the weak light squares... I don't know. I'm I'm with you as well. I asked you to kind of explain it, but I, I don't know. To me, to me, this is a, a definitely a double edge game for sure. And I don't think it's the worst version, uh, the worst version black could have in this kind of exchange. Yeah, especially because there are no weak pawns to attack. So black says I have the two bishops. I can start breaking open the position with an eventual F5 move that surely yep. will be played. And there it is. Here it and comes. Now, if you, if you play B takes C5, you just help black out by undoubling the pawns with D takes C5 in return. The rook on b8 is perfectly situated there. Yep. Looks good. It looks really good for black. Yeah, I'm liking it more and more. And, and at some point, this tension is going to break in the closed position, and these pieces will come to life. Right on cue there, a position completely locked by pawns is what we would define as a closed setup. Um, usually, you define a closed position by whether the center itself is open or closed. Um but if the position stays closed, the bishop pair won't be that big of a deal. But if it opens up, the slight square bishop and the bishop pair in general will be an advantage for black. Yep, definitely. I mean, you, you, but this position isn't closed like the one we saw in the diagram because there are still pawn tension. Pawn breaks are possible here. It's not a totally locked position as we saw in said diagram. We would so call that I a think... semi-closed position, right? Karpov special. Yeah. And here we got the baseball field right in the center, right? From there D6, you go. Yeah, the diamond. C5, D4, E5. Yeah. And what Robert's adding as far as the context of that comment about it's it's a closed position right now, but it's considered semi-closed because there's enough tension points where files and diagonals can become open that it's not something you would consider deadlocked totally. But but um, that and that's really where the storyline of the position is all about. Who how how do we break this right? Black would love for White to make some move like captures and start to open up light squares. 
and and here Black decides to capture. Maybe he'll take twice. Indeed, he does, giving up A for B, but trying to maybe use the B file in the process. Yep. And that's and what he does. Black, Black is first the activity because if this E1 rook was already on A1, he could play rook A7. Yep. I might have a different tune here. But if you ever play rook A1, then there's rook, wait, rook B2. He's hung his queen. What is he doing? Wait. Oh, is, is rook E2 at the end? Wow. I, I looked at the camera because normally I see some emotion, but Maxime just, you know, calm as a kitten well, he, over there. He knew his position was bad, which is why he went for this. Yeah, but I but really this... like this decision. Look how look how difficult it is now for Black. Oh, wait, D3 falls. Never mind. Nah, horrible. Bad queen sack, Maxime. No, but you're not totally wrong because he can possibly set up a blockade here. It doesn't seem likely, but there is outside potential of setting up a blockade, in which case the decision yeah, but C4 can be justified. Yeah, but C4 C4 is falling, and the D. I, hey, we're doing a role reversal here. Usually, you're the one who sticks up for the queen sack. Uh, bad sacrifices. Now I'm the one who's trying. But <laughs> look what I've my, done to you. Look what I've done to you. You've, you've corrupted me. I've corrupted. No, this is this is a bad. This was you. Had, your instincts were right first. It was done out of desperation. Let's back up and really kind of show it because the truth is. Back in this position, I think, as you said, you would normally like white if white was already on the A file, but he wasn't. And so black was the one ahead of the game. He didn't want to settle on a passive move rook A2, everybody, to guard rook B2. So instead, he kind of justifies in his brain a bad queen sack, something we hope he does tomorrow versus me, that being Maxine. <laughs> And and but the fact that the D pawn falls in exchange for you getting enough material is just I didn't see that when I first went for it. If if, if something like this happens, just to show, this is why I liked it for a brief second because now you've got a rook, a knight, and a pawn, and dominance on the blockade here. I would love white, but the fact that the D pawn falls is kind of a catalyst, and um, and uh, that that is going to be yeah. Wesley Wesley's going to go on to win this one and take the lead. And, and Maxime is just. Kind of wasting time right now, yeah. not in a, in a unsportsmanlike way, 